Fernando, you've been working on issues of poverty and economic reform, legal empowerment for over 20 years. In fact, uh, the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan appointed you, along with Madeleine Albright, to co-chair a commission on the legal empowerment of the poor. What have you learned over these 20 years, and what have been some of the key findings of your commission? Yes, of course. The, uh, the high-level commission on the legal empowerment of the poor, uh, that as you mentioned, uh, I co-chair with uh, Matt, Madeleine Albright, is looking precisely at those issues. And it's a very interesting commission because it is uh, formed by people on all sides of the political spectrum. Uh, and the purpose was to make sure, in very UN fashion, if you want to, that everybody's concerns were taken into consideration, which means that there's been a lot of debate. Uh, it's, not an easy, it's not an easy commission. And people have different concerns. But what's interesting is that over time, we've all come to the agreement as the numbers come in, as the specialized commissions bring in uh, the data and uh, as consultations take place in each developing country, all commission members have become aware from uh, Kenya uh, to uh, Indonesia that all the poor want private property rights. It's there. Uh, and uh, as time has gone by, we've taken into consideration the fact that, yes, many people that have tried to have market reforms have also used uh, the words market reforms to actually create rights, but only for themselves and not everybody else. So there's crony capitalism in the, in the process and there's mean mercantilism. In other words, what the Commission does point out is that it's dangerous. Like everything in the world, it can be hijacked. And so those considerations have been taken into place, but I think we're able to preserve there the principle that the objective is a market that works for everybody. So it's interesting, after two years, I think we're going to bring out a report that takes everybody's concerns and fears into consideration, but accepts that the Human, uh, the human Rights Charter, uh, the, human, the Declaration of Human Rights, uh, in its Article 17, which said that everybody has a right to property rights, in other words, meta rights, the rights to rights, was absolutely correct. We're going to be able to confirm it and we're going to be able to give substance to that article. And uh, what has been great about the way the Commission has uh, proceeded is that even arguments as those that might be genuinely expressed by the populist uh, left in Latin America are taken into consideration, but the final result is yes, but we're still talking about poor people getting property rights because that's what they want to in their vast majority. Fernando, everything we've been talking about here today relates back to the idea of legal empowerment, to the idea that there is a democracy deficit. In fact, you introduced that concept, democracy deficit, at a conference that we sponsored uh, at the U.S. Chamber, site-sponsored some years ago. Do you still feel that way? Do you still feel that there is a deficit in the quality of democracy in Latin America and in many of the other countries you've been working in around the world? And if so, what do we need to do to correct that deficit? Well, yes, uh, I do still believe that we have a democratic deficit. Uh, we have gotten somewhat better over time, uh, even in the case of Peru, uh, more and more laws are being pre-published in their draft form. There are more systems of consultation. Some of them have come in through uh, ombudsman organizations that we ourselves have formed in the case of uh, Peru. But it's still not enough. It's still not enough to give democracy a real good name. Uh, what's missing, as we had said then, and that hasn't changed, is the fact that democracy here is seen exclusively, or not exclusively, it's based essentially on open elections and free elections. The problem is that once you finish the electoral process and somebody's elected president and people are elected to, to Congress, there's no control whatsoever over these people. So public opinion goes one way and uh, the government goes the other way. And that's why after a year or two, all our governments become very shaky and have very high disapproval ratings. We have, uh, as then, no 
comment and notice periods like you do in the United States. Uh, our Congress people and senators are not elected on a district basis. There are just one list that responds to nobody in particular and the nation in general, which is of course no one because uh, all politics is local. You've got to respond to specific people and you've got to have complaints mechanisms and feedback mechanisms that are um, pinpointed and that make people and political authorities accountable. Um, we have no uh, cost-benefit analysis for the for, for the rules. We have uh, very bad judiciary, a very corrupt judiciary. It's well known it's, uh, where, wherever you go. I mean, we're more and more conscious of it. It doesn't mean that we haven't improved, but it does mean that it's still unreliable to the point that every time we sign bilateral international treaties with people from your country, we make a lot of exceptions, and one of them is the court and giving everybody a right to arbitration because we don't trust our own courts, at least for foreigners. So there remains a lot of things to be done. And that, unfortunately, has been, uh, uh, has been very clear in the course of these last two years when uh, those countries that haven't gone towards a populist left um, have, have missed doing so by just a hair's breadth, which means that, first of all, it's not as bad as the past, when uh, whoever was against uh, for the private sector would be overwhelmingly voted out. At least we're somewhere close to 50-50, but that's still not good enough. We should really have 100% uh, of the population on the side of markets because that's what they're doing. It's really a legal lag. It's a lag of uh, our political elites who, interestingly enough, after all these years, and it's kind of punishing to have to say it, punishing for oneself, haven't realized the importance of law and institutions. Uh, it's, it's so interesting, you know, what everybody talks about in the information technology revolution, how important rules are, how important codes are, how important icons and symbols are, and uh, how it's all about getting your categories right and, uh, and, and having your hierarchies in place. In other words, the whole thing is about form rather than substance. Uh, we're not even close to that yet. Uh, the legal profession continues being seen as a very selfish one that is used by mainly those who can pay it. So it's unfortunate. I suppose we'll get there, but when I, we talked about this in the, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce many years ago, I was thinking that we would get there during my lifetime. I doubt it now, but it doesn't mean we have to give up hope. It just means that it's a tougher fight than we had expected.